Namaskara and welcome to BIC Talks, a podcast brought to you by Bangalore International Center, where we present conversations that move, inform, and encourage discourse. Today, if I were to say what's the leading symbol or what's gone wrong with capitalism in places like America, it's property prices. Like as I say in the book, that 20, 30 years ago, it would take three years for you to sort of make your down payment if you want to buy a new home. Today, it takes 18 to 19 years. There's a real affordability crisis in America today as far as like home prices are concerned. And it's because of regulation, supply has been totally constrained, very hard to build. But on the demand side, you have so much money which is being poured in that you have all these private equity people, other people just accumulating homes consistently. And so this is a source of major frustration. Again, an examination that today, I think that nearly half of people in their 20s in America are forced to live with their parents. Whereas like a generation ago, about 20-25% of people in their 20s were forced to live with their parents. So it's become a real problem and a source of major angst in terms of having these very high property prices. And asset price inflation is something which has caused that. What went wrong with capitalism? In his new book, Ruchi Sharma says progressives are partly right when they mock modern capitalism as socialism for the rich. For a century, governments have expanded in just about every measurable dimension, from spending to regulation and the scale of financial rescues when the economy wobbles. The result is expensive state guarantees for everyone, bailouts for the rich, entitlements for the middle class, welfare for the poor. The author will be in conversation with chairman and co-founder of Infosys, Nandan Nilekani. This episode is adapted from an event that took place at the Bangalore International Center in August of 2024. My heart is really that of a writer. I was a bit fortunate, which is that in school, there were many people who were much brighter, more intelligent than I was. But I was just fortunate in one single way, which is that at a very early age, when I was, I'd say in the 11th grade or so, I found a calling and that was economics. I fell in love with economics for some reason as a subject. And after that, all I wanted to do was to study economics and financial markets. And this was back in the early 1990s. And it was very difficult to get access to this kind of information. I was living in Delhi. I'd just come back from Singapore for a few years when my father was posted. And then I started to sort of take a keen interest in economics, reading financial papers that I could get my hands on, listening to BBC at night to get the business report about what was happening around the world. And then after I finished my 12th grade, I was fortunate enough to be introduced to a gentleman by the name of R.K. Mishra. And uh, he offered me a chance to do a summer internship that summer at a new paper that was started back then called the Business and Political Observer. So I started writing for them and this was 1991, summer of 91. And nobody else in the world of journalism was really interested in writing about what was happening in the rest of the world. India hadn't really opened up then. And the first maiden budget of Manmohan Singh was in July of 1991, which I had the privilege of witnessing from the speaker's gallery that year. One of the benefits of having a journalist pass So then I decided, you know, in terms of the fact that this is my calling, this is what I want to write about. And I began to write this column back then. And soon enough, the Economic Times, after after a few months, was interested in publishing the same column. So then I moved on to the Economic Times and I started to write for them. In the last 33 years, it is something I can feel proud of that I've never missed a month where I've not written a column or an op-ed for some newspaper in the world. So that's really been my true calling. Then after that, when I was writing for the Economic Times, I felt like a bit of an imposter because I was forced to put up this act that they never knew what my real age was. And I was very scared that if they ever got to know what my real age was, they'd throw me out. That, you know, who's this kid writing for us? But I just kept hoping that the commentary and the stuff that I would write, it was a column called Forex Watch, capturing the trends in the rest of the world. And that's what would carry me through. So I kept doing that. And my ambition back, then was that I want to go to America and do a PhD in economics after I finished my graduation. That point in time, I was studying in Delhi. And then just as I was preparing to go for my PhD and I'd finished my graduation and I was working for an Indian financial firm to just bide my time, 
some folks at Morgan Stanley happened to read what I was writing and were quite fascinated that who's this kid sitting in India writing about global stuff. And then they made an offer to me, which I'll never forget, which, where the line was that, do you want to make money or do you want to study? I said, I want to make money. So I gave up the ambition to do PhD and then I started to work for Morgan Stanley and I worked there for 25 years, mostly based out of New York. But the thing that I did consistently through this process was always to be a writer. And a lot of my thinking and thought process was shaped also by what happened in India in the 1970s and 1980s when I was a kid growing up in India. And in the formative years, I had the fortune of being in Singapore. I did my seventh to 10th grade in Singapore. I was, my father was in a transferable job. He got posted in Singapore with the Indian High Commission there. And that was a very fascinating, like sort of experience to me, like at a very young age, that sort of struck me that here is Singapore and this economy is booming and prospering. And it was also a colony of the British until a few decades before that. And it had been even poorer than India by some metrics at the time when India got its independence in 1947. That what has Singapore done so right that India has not done right? And the contrast for me was that in Singapore, even though it was not a true democracy, it gave its people incredible amount of economic freedom. Whereas in India, for me, the contrast was that India gave its people political freedom, but never gave its people much economic freedom. And so therefore, we had these lost decades where India's ranking in the rest of the world kept slipping. In fact, in 1947, India was among the largest economies in the world when it got its independence, even though its per capita income is very low. And then its rankings kept on slipping for the next three or four decades as the rest of the world, particularly East Asia, took off and India languished for a long period of time. And at the heart of it, my belief always was that because India did not get enough economic freedom and followed a socialist path, that we had these lost decades where we really fell behind the rest of the world. And in 1991, finally, when we had a big economic crisis and that model was totally discredited, both in India and globally, we decided to change course and start giving our people much more economic freedom. And for me, that's really what capitalism is about at its core, giving people economic freedom. As I was writing this book on what went wrong with capitalism, someone sort of told me that, let's start off by defining what do you mean by capitalism and what do you mean by socialism at a very basic level. And for me, capitalism, as I said, was about giving people economic freedom and socialism was about the government deciding for you as to what they will do. And it was a very basic level contrast that I sort of kept in mind. And I was really lucky to be in the United States and to prosper from that capitalist system that America had. So then the question was that, why am I now writing a book which says what went wrong with capitalism? And how did this idea really come about? It was years of thinking, but I would say that a couple of things I would point to. One was that after the global financial crisis in 2008, there was a lot of anger in America and in the Western world that all these rich banks and rich financial institutions are getting bailed out. Whereas so many people working at community banks and other smaller institutions were allowed to go bust. There was a lot of anger that nobody was accountable for what happened in the global financial crisis in a way that nobody went to jail, nobody sort of you know, paid a really big price for it, and they got bailed out by governments at the end of the day. So a lot of anger. And then as the economic recovery began after the 2009 financial crisis, there was so much cheap money which was poured by central banks that it created an incredible amount of wealth at the top and inequality began to just move to very different levels. Inequality was increasing even before that, but it seemed to go on steroids after the global financial crisis of 2008, where so much cheap money was flooded into the system that it went into the pockets of lots of rich elite people and you, it minted lots of billionaires. But if I thought that was a bit unjust and something wrong was happening with the economic system, then I did not obviously factor in the pandemic and what the pandemic would do. Because in 2020, for the first time, governments back then decided to shut down their economies everywhere. And the confidence of shutting down the economies was that, okay, even if we shut economies down, we can just give so much stimulus 
out there that it won't matter, which is that we can just paper over the shutdowns, tell people to be at home, lock economies down, and we can just tell them, okay, we're just going to give you stimulus, and we're just going to pour so much money into the system that you will never feel any economic pain of the shutdowns. It seemed like almost too good to be true that you just tell people to sit home and you give them all these checks and you expect no consequences with little work being done when things are shut down. So it just struck me as something wrong about it. And then I was seeing, and this is the part of being on Wall Street, I was seeing the way the money was flowing, that so much of the pandemic stimulus in some of these Western countries, not only was it unprecedented, but so much of it went to really rich people. The number of billionaires who were created in 2020 was the highest on record. The amount of wealth creation which happened in 2020, the pandemic year, was quite incredible out there. And you had the government and central banks in the West actually buying corporate paper of even companies associated with legends such as Warren Buffett. So it struck me that something is really wrong out there. And then I was seeing some of the polling data that was coming out. That on one hand, people were getting these free checks, which were benefiting the rich even more because people earning more than $100,000 too were getting checks sitting at home. And all this free money from the Fed and other central banks was leading to this incredible increase in the number of billionaires around the world. And yet the polling data was showing something very sort of strange and surprising to me. The polling data at that point in time was showing that most people in countries such as America thought that their economies were moving in the wrong direction. In fact, even today, two thirds of Americans feel that their economy or their country is moving in the wrong direction. And possibly this was the most telling statistic as to why I began by telling you about the origin of my journey to the thought of writing this book, that surveys were showing that most young Americans saying that they would rather have socialism than have capitalism. So here is the beacon of capitalism, the so-called land of the free, land of incredible opportunity. But here, many young Americans saying they would rather have socialism than capitalism. And this sort of brought it back full circle to me, that really, we grew up knowing what socialism was in India in the 1970s and even in the 1980s. And here in America, they have never really experienced what true socialism is, that they're yearning for socialism. What's the matter out here? And hence, this idea came to write this book. It's an examination of really why have people in the West become so disillusioned with their current economic system. As I argue in the book, it's a revisionist history. It begins with the origins of capitalism in America back in the 17th century and then charts the course as to what happened to capitalism over the next 200 years until the 1920s and how capitalism began to change after the Great Depression of the 1930s. So it's a revisionist history of what happens with capitalism. But the book is really a deep examination of why people have become so disillusioned with the current economic system, which they label as capitalism. And as again, in the opening remarks, as was said, that I was keen to examine, you know, like the fact that deep down that what happened out here, that why do so many people feel that this is capitalism, but in effect, it is socialism for the rich. Why is that feeling so pervasive amongst many people? Why does the average American, and it's even worse in Europe, in places like France and stuff, why do these people feel that the system is not working for them? And as I argue in the book, that in my sort of examination, the conclusion I reach is that capitalism did not fail, it was ruined. What ruined capitalism? What ruined capitalism for me is that it came to be pro big business, came to be pro-incumbent, whereas capitalism at its core should be pro-competition, should be pro-churn. There is something wrong with capitalism when a handful of companies keep on making super normal profits as the current tech companies make. There's something wrong with capitalism when the rate of churn declines, when new entrants coming into the system decline and the incumbents in the entrenched remain in place for a longer period of time. You take the example of how distorted capitalism has become. A couple of examples out here. One, that, you know, a lot of people think of the 1980s as the start of some big free market revolution of Thatcher, Reagan, these people coming to power and stuff. And yet, 
in the middle of that so-called revolution, a couple of things happened which distorted capitalism quite significantly. In America, right up until the 1980s, there was no culture of bailing out private sector companies. It was not the government's job to bail out private sector companies was the thinking in America. And then in 1984, you had the first major bailout of a financial institution, that of Continental Illinois. Once you had that bailout, it set a precedent for all sorts of bailouts to happen. And each time there was even the whiff of a crisis, the bailout became bigger and bigger with the savings and loans crisis in the late 1980s, the hedge fund LTCM crisis in 1998, obviously the 2008 global financial crisis and then the pandemic. The size of the stimulus, the size of the bailouts became bigger and bigger. Now, when you are bailing out private sector companies, there are two major consequences of that. One, that by doing so, you keep alive a lot of dead wood in the system. You're not allowing a natural process of churn and companies to be destroyed and new ones to come. And by extension, you are slowing down the entry of new companies if you have so many deadwood companies which are there in the system today with a combination of bailouts and a combination of throwing easy money at the system. So like a chapter I have in the book talks about the zombification of capitalism. What does this mean? You know, the term zombie companies became popular in the 1990s in Japan. That's when a lot of easy money was thrown when the Japanese economy started to go bust to keep alive many companies. The American media at that point in time would write to say that, hey, Japan's doing this. We in America don't believe in this. The New York Times and all these newspapers would write about this. At that point in time, the number of zombie companies in America, which are defined as companies that have not made enough profit to even cover their interest payments for three years in a row. And so therefore they're forced to keep going to the market to borrow. The number of such zombie companies in America was just 2% of the total number of listed companies in America. Today, by some independent measures, the number of zombie companies in America is 20% of the total number of companies in the country today. So it just tells you about what happens when you bail out, give easy money, and the so-called zombification of capitalism that follows. And the other thing which happened was in 1987, which is that the stock market crashed in October of 1987 by 20% in one day, a memorable day. For the first time in the history of America, the central bank led by Alan Greenspan back then explicitly intervened to prop up the stock market. And since that day, that term came to be known as the Greenspan put, which is that the central banks from then on were seen to be institutions which would let you capitalize on, on gains, but on the downside, they were there to protect you. And so therefore, this asymmetry of risk took place, which now is defined as that you have, it's capitalism on the upside, but socialism on the downside, which is that the profits can be capitalized, but the risks are socialized. And that is what I think has led to major distortions on the system. So as they say about capitalism, that, Capitalism without bankruptcy is like Christianity without hell. You need a purging mechanism. You need a cleansing mechanism out there. And that creative, destructive fiber of the economy has been badly undermined and destroyed by these type of government interventions. In fact, the analogy I use in the book here is to say that in America, they're facing a massive opiate crisis. And their approach to economic management has become very similar to their approach to pain management now, which is the slightest hint of any trouble, just administer the patient with opiates. So they become hooked to like opiates. And so that's why I think that's the same approach that you have now to economic management as well. Slightest hint of trouble. Three weeks ago, the stock market falls by four, five percent. There's a clamor. We've got to cut interest rates. We've got to do this. So just to conclude here, this book that I've written, as I said, is an examination of what happened to capitalism in the West. It's a journey that begins in India, the relevance for India as well in this. We are on the path to becoming a more market-oriented and a more capitalist society. But we are far from being there. We are on that journey. What are the lessons that we can learn, which are right and wrong, from the way that West has approached its capitalist model? Where are we going right? Where are we going wrong in this approach? Is it right for India today to have billionaire wealth as a share of its economy at 26%, which is where we are today, the highest in the world of any major nation?
are Indian policies also as much pro big business or are they truly pro competition? What is the downside of having too much regulation in terms of it? Who does it really benefit? So these are some of the critical things that I've examined in the book. And one of my favorite chapters in the book is about where is capitalism still working? That if in America there's so much disillusionment with capitalism, which are the countries which can be held out as hope? Like I speak extensively about a country that I love to visit, but also a country that is, happens to be the richest country in the world and among the five happiest countries in the world, Switzerland. So what are they doing right? Why are people so happy and so rich at the same time out there? It's an examination of that, a journey of the rest of the world. But above all, as I say, the first step to a cure is to admit the problem. That you have an American presidential election now, there's a lot of focus on personality, not enough on policy, but whatever policy suggestions are given seem to suggest both on the right and the left that the answer to all the problems is even more government in terms of that. Now they're talking about price controls on one side, the other side just wants to cut taxes without any care for what that does to deficits or spending or sort of engage in more tariffs. So in terms of what are the consequences of all this and one thing which I've tried to do in America is to make sure that I get this book in the hands of some of these people who are likely to come to power in terms of that but at least let's get the some sort of understanding of what's the basic problem where are we going to draw the line on bailouts where are we going to draw the line on regulation who is all this benefiting who is all this hurting so that's something which I've tried my best to do but the overall message of the book is that Capitalism is still the best model for progress, only if it were allowed to work. Thank you. Gee, thanks. I think that was amazing. And the book is amazing, very thought-provoking, and very readable. So I wanted to talk to you about, does the US, because it decides global currency, dollar is the, how much is the fact that the dollar is the world's currency. How much does that help them get away with it? The fact that the dollar is the world's reserve currency. So how does this really play itself out, right? You know, just to sort of explain this, that because the dollar is the world's reserve currency, it means that the borrowing costs in America can be lower than what they would have otherwise been because so many people are forced to hold dollars around the world, right? So it sort of lowers the natural borrowing cost relative to what their deficits are. But remember that nothing in economics or life is permanent. America has been the world's reserve currency for 100 years. Historically, every 100 years, the world's reserve currency has changed. Before the dollar, it used to be sterling. Before that, it used to be the French franc. Before that, it was the Spanish currency, the Portuguese, the Dutch, right? So like every 100 years, it changes. So it's a big risk for America to believe that it can get away with anything it wants, all because it has the world's reserve currency. But you're completely correct that it allows them, let's say, a longer rope to hang themselves. This idea in the 70s, born vigilantes, who were supposed to keep an eye, and if government's deficit went up, they would you know, attack the, the bonds and the interest rates. So there are no more born vigilantes anywhere now, except in that brief episode in the UK, where Liz Truss was knocked out of that. So is that whole idea that, I mean, there's no governor on the system of issuing more and more bonds, right? Well, it can come back, right? So which is what, why did this dissipate? It's generally dissipated, I mean, in terms of that, because of two reasons. One, that inflation had been very low around the world. And so therefore, interest rates also were allowed to be very low. And the second, I have to say something that even as far as America is concerned, America's had two advantages. One, that relative, that there's been no other reserve currency in sight. Because China, for example, has been the big disappointment that China could have taken over some of the reserve currency status, given the fact that today the Chinese economy, despite its troubles, is, you know, about 18% or something of the global economy today. It's still relatively large. Yet the Chinese currency, because it's a closed capital account, is barely used, maybe 2 or 3% in global transactions. So that's one big advantage that America has had. Two, that Europe's, you know, something which I've examined in the book, that capitalism is in worse shape in Europe right? In terms of, as someone put it, that if you think America is bad for regulation, then Europe is the Silicon Valley of regulation. So I'd say that 
those are two advantages that america has had that the relative threats to it from an economic perspective have been diminished having said that the problem i think now is getting to be this which is that both the campaigns currently they've now imbibed this message that deficits don't matter at least in the past the politicians would pay some heed to it in fact under clinton america ran a budget surplus also for a brief period of time so and on average america would run a budget deficit for the last 20 30 years over 3% of gdp which was roughly in line with other developed countries so you could say that yes this is a global phenomenon everyone's doing that and you know what's the big deal if america also has 3% has the world's reserve currency it's all fine but here's where things begin to shift and change today we are in the midst of a proper economic recovery in america they are running a budget deficit of 6% of gdp and that's multiple times higher than any other or multiple times higher than the average of other countries in the world particularly the developed countries and stuff 6% of gdp budget deficit america is running and if there is a downturn it will be 8 9 or 10% of gdp and both the campaigns are speaking as if this just doesn't matter you know the harris campaign let's spend trump let's just cut taxes and deficits don't matter i suspect that this is going to soon come back to haunt right in terms of that, that that i know that for a long period of time this has all been sounding like crying wolf in terms of that but if you begin to sort of really push it like they are pushing it now i think it is going to come back to haunt them because today they're living of one strength which is their tech sector the incredible part of their tech sector the fact that they've been you know, at the cutting edge of innovation and technology and something we recognize in fact you may recall i wrote my first book breakout nations like in 2012 the basic thesis of that book was that all these bricks are overhyped this this like in like 2012 and the true breakout nation of the world is america principally because of its tech sector i wish i'd invested my career accordingly but i didn't put my money where my mouth is yeah i got stuck with emerging markets but I, so the whole point here being nandan that this is now like we have come full circle they're really pushing it now if you look at those 20 years 30 years 1990 to 2015 or thereabouts the link between deficit financing and inflation was broken right i mean the general belief was that if you have deficit financing you print more money prices are bound to go up because there's more money in the system but prices didn't go up and as you have pointed in the book essentially globalization which meant that first opening up of europe eastern europe and then china and southeast asia suddenly flooded the world with uh, labor and therefore prices were low and then of course globalization and supply chain and all that so that game is over right so the period when we had the dealing between deficits and inflation is over so now is inflation back in a big way is it is is higher for longer or what is it i think so but you know these things take a long period of time right because even today we have deglobalization at one level but you still have a lot of american people and other people moving away from china to other emerging markets vietnam cambodia is a bit of india a bit of indonesia and stuff like that these are slow moving things and remember technology is still sort of acting as a big deflator of prices and the other thing which we've seen today is that one thing which is keeping inflation like a little on inflation is that the chinese economy is like deflating it's imploding literally like in china today you have negative inflation today in china if you look at the gdp deflator and stuff that is a very significant deflationary shock in terms of what's going on but the point that i make in the book as well is that in a lot of this excess money which the fed and the other central banks have been throwing out hasn't led to inflation because of globalization and because of technology it has instead led to asset price inflation that asset prices have gone up a lot and that continues to be the case because you know like in terms of property prices stock prices these have exploded particularly in places like america and it's become a source of major grievance like in america well i think it's an outdated idea because central bank inflation targeting was good and it's required when your main threat was consumer price inflation but the fact that you're not taking into account asset price inflation i think is something which is and this has negative consequences you you say okay what's the problem if asset prices are going up today if i were to say what's the leading symbol or what's gone wrong with capitalism in places like america it's property prices like as i say in the book that 20 30 years ago it would take 3 years for you to sort of make your down payment if you want to buy a new home today it takes 18 to 19 years there's a real affordability crisis in america today as far as like home prices are concerned and it's because of regulation supply has been totally constrained 
very hard to build. But on the demand side, you have so much money which is being poured in that you have all these private equity people, other people just accumulating homes consistently. And so this is a source of major frustration. Again, an examination that today, I think that nearly half of people in their 20s in America are forced to live with their parents. Whereas like a generation ago, about 20-25% of people in their 20s were forced to live with their parents. So it's become a real problem and a source of major angst in terms of having these very high property prices. And asset price inflation is something which has caused that. The asset price inflation obviously benefits people already rich or people who have homes or art or whatever it is. And the same thing happened on the monopoly side, right? I mean, there was this whole thesis that as long as consumer welfare is fine, there's no need to have a monopoly thing. So the, the Bork thesis. And that again led to this. So both the inflation theory on the consumer price and the consumer welfare theory on antitrust, both of them led to the same issues, these oligopolies and so on. Is that what you found Absolutely. out? Absolutely. So like in the in the chapter, like on oligopolies, I've argued that it's, you know, like a, there's a common sort of argument that the reason why these tech companies have become so big and something that you can sort of dispute, I guess, is the fact that it's because there's a strong network effect. As I show in the book that it's not because of a network effect, because across industries, you have two or three companies which are becoming more and more dominant across industries. So it's not just technology. Even in very domestic oriented industries, you have like whether it's beer producers, coffin producers, you have two or three dominant players happening in each sector. So you have an oligopoly problem that's taking place across various sectors in places like America. And the reason why I argue that's happening is because of the government effect, not the network effect. How does this happen? For example, in America, in the last 20 years, they've been on a regulatory overdrive. They've implemented 3,000 new regulations a year. How many regulations have they withdrawn? over the last 20 years, 20 in total, right? So you have 3,000 new regulations you keep dumping into the system and you've withdrawn 20 regulations in total. What are the consequences of this? Who does regulation benefit? So, like I know it, if you're setting up a fund in America today, the cost of doing that has gone up 10 times over the last 20 years. So it's become very hard for a small to mid-sized person to survive. The big firms have the financial muscle to deal with all this regulatory stuff. So they can deal with it. But for the small person, the break-even is much higher. And the second thing, as we know, that all the top lobbyists today in Washington are all the big firms. And so they have much greater regulatory capture. So regulation, by definition, is pro-incumbent and tends to be pro-big business in terms of that. I think this is a fundamental message which has not been understood in terms of, you know, like when you devise policy. That's one of the big distortions that's been caused by capitalism, it's about oligopolies. And it's a very distressing situation. In so many American towns today that I go to, the employer is one company, right? Because they have such a domination in that, what in economic terms is called monopsonies. It, like it feels so oppressive to have one company be the sole employer in any small town in terms of, you know, where's your negotiating power then when the, that doesn't happen? And you have great corporate inequality that if you happen to work for one of the large firms, you end up earning multiple times what you do than if you work for a mid-sized firm in the same sector. So I think that these are all problems because capitalism at its core is supposed to be pro-competition. It's not supposed to be pro-big business. And I think that this is one of the big fault lines that is coming through as a result of such policy interventions with regulation being at the top of the heap. But I think one aspect, of course, regulation favors the big guys because they can hire lawyers and so on. But I think the other thing which has happened in the U.S. is this nimbyism, you know, not in my backyard. And therefore, it's impossible to do anything. A hundred years back, New York built all these great bridges, Triborough Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge, and they built them in a matter of years. Today, they can't even do a pavement properly because to do the payment, you have to get 20 approvals. And somebody says, I don't want that payment to be improved. So he puts a... So how do you deal with this? This is the other part of this, right? The one is the big company stuff and the other is the nimbyism. So you need someone like to smash that, right? Which is the fact that to explain to people that, hey, this is what the results are. This is why you have a dysfunction of capitalism. So as I said, the first step to a cure is to admit what the problem is. Today in America, someone, you know, like at a leading private equity firm, ironically gave me a statistic that the number of new homes being built in America today is the same as it was in the 1950s. So population has doubled, but the number of new homes being built is the same as it was like in the 1950s. There's an affordability crisis in America because of very high prices that 
We have the worst affordability in America since the early 1980s in terms of when interest rates were 10, 12% and stuff like that. So these are the negative consequences of it. And so my basic take also in the book is that can we call this system true capitalism? Is this what the founders had in mind? When you have nimbyism, you have over-regulation of the system, you're not allowing the market to respond. If you have high prices, you should get a flood of new supply, which should come. But if you have a regulatory environment that completely curtails new supply and prices remain elevated, that's not true capitalism. But how come it's not an election issue? In the sense, as you said, the left wants to have more and more programs and price controls, and the right wants to cut taxes. Both these things will increase deficits and make it more complicated. So how come they don't get your message? I know, it seems so simple, right? Which is the fact that I think there are two things here. One, and we've learned this, you know, taking it back to India. We have learned that unless and until you have a crisis, outright financial crisis, nobody changes. Even in the West, the countries which have changed. For example, the biggest success story in the West in the last 10 years is a country which was at this time, a decade ago, a poster child of everything that went wrong. Greece, right? They have a crisis, they go bankrupt virtually, then they are forced to reform and they clean the system up. Same thing happened in India in 1991. So unless and until you have an outright crisis, no one really acts. And the second thing, like as I feel, is the fact that, that it's so tempting to keep offering government solutions. So housing affordability is now becoming a, some sort of an electoral issue, but the no one's really offering solutions which will hurt the status quo too much. The easiest solution to offer is what? Let's give more subsidies for people to buy homes, right? Because why? That's the easy thing that to do. That will again increase your deficit, right? Exactly. So that's where we are stuck out there. And I feel that this is where, like in terms of India and stuff as we're looking, I mean, I feel our economic trajectory compared to what's happening there is much better. You also look at various countries and you speak about three countries, Switzerland, Taiwan, and uh, the third one is yeah. Vietnam. But the two countries that are missing in analysis are China and India. So what went right in China and what's going wrong in China? As far as China was concerned, we all grew up in awe of China. I think that what China did for 30 to 40 years was an incredibly successful story, right? I mean, that I don't think in the history of economic development, any country has succeeded the way China did between 1978, right up until I'd say five, 10 years ago and stuff. But I think there's one thing we have to remember about China, you know, which is something which we really underappreciate. It may have been a communist country, but it really followed a policy of ruthless capitalism. There was no welfare state in China until five, 10 years ago. In the 1990s, China fired, fired is the only word to use here, nearly 100 million people in its public sector enterprises. They were just told, out of a job, go figure out what needs to be done. And the private sector just boomed in China under Zhu Rongji, uh, you know, like the leaders back then. So I think that this understanding of China is, you know, like a bit that we think of China as a strong state, as a communist state. Politically, yes. But economically, China went from being a very command and control economy to systematically bringing down one barrier after another. It was completely open for foreign business. At the peak of the Chinese economic boom, they were attracting foreign direct investment of 4% of GDP. India today attracts foreign direct investment on a gross basis of 1% of GDP. And they slashed tariffs. They made you know, like themselves uh, globally competitive. They made themselves into an export machine in terms of what was there. And even in things like technology and stuff, as you know, in China, they were cutting edge. So I was in awe of the Chinese economic model for much of my working career and, and growing up. The problems I began to see on China, and which I wrote about extensively, starting within breakout nations nearly a decade ago, was the fact that in the end, China began to rely on too much debt to grow. So same problem. Same, yeah, exactly. For a different purpose. Yeah. So China, in terms of, was wedded to an economic model right up until 2007. China's economic growth and debt levels were increasing in parallel, which is fine, one to one. After 2008, you know, like they still wanted to keep growing at their very high growth rates. And so then they started to use three, four, five dollars of debt to generate one dollar of GDP growth. So, and it was fueled by a massive property sector boom, which took place. That was one problem. And the second problem in China is the fact that the 
country's population today is actually shrinking. It's not just working age population. The overall population now in China has began to shrink. A long consequence of its one-child policy, which it followed. So the debt and demographics in China have, are very negative. You know, this is one of the very basic laws of economics. No country in the world has been able to grow at any meaningful rate when your population growth is shrinking. Because you need population growth and you, and you need productivity. Productivity can only do that much for you. But if your population is shrinking, you can't grow. So therefore, I feel that China's growth rate in the next few years, they'll be lucky to grow at two or three percent. Also, do you think that China's current leadership has abandoned the Deng model of growth and all that? They've become much more inward, much more nationalistic, and much more self-reliant. That's the way. And you know, it sort of gets caught in a bit of a vicious loop, right? Because the more nationalistic and self-reliant you become, the more skeptical outsiders become of you, and then you want to become even more nationalistic and self-reliant, not knowing that when you could be cut off the global supply chains and stuff. So. Definitely, like a more assertive state, and Xi Jinping sort of doing that, like in terms of abandoning the old model, is there. But even before Xi Jinping, I'd say this debt and demographics; these are very structural issues. There's not much you can do about that, right? Population is shrinking. What do you do with it? You know, like a shrinking population. No country in the world is able to grow of at more than two percent if you have like a shrinking population growth. So I think that's the reason why China was something I was in awe of. But I think that this is why it's like it's fallen off. India, I've spoken about, like in the book, you know, the, the other country that you spoke about. I think that as far as India is concerned, I think that the trajectory is broadly positive. But remember, we have not taken reforms of the kind that China ever took, or the risks that China took with its economic reforms. We still haven't done land reform. We still haven't done labor reform properly compared to what could be done. And there's no talk of privatization anymore. So India is generally moving in the right direction. We've given our people more economic freedom. You know, like I feel quite positive, but I'm also a bit wary of when we get into too much of a self-congratulatory mode and stuff. When I, the reason we are growing very rapidly today, a major reason is that a per capita income is three thousand dollars, and from that base, it is relatively easier to grow compared to the fact that if your base is twenty thousand or thirty thousand dollars, much harder to grow. So therefore, I've not cited them as leading examples. And in India's case, where as you well know. That the state here. I mean, this book is a lot about the reason I've chosen Switzerland, Taiwan, and Vietnam in particular is to show that these countries have a very effective state, which is what the West doesn't have. I mean, you have France at one extreme. France today, government spending as a share of GDP is sixty percent, six zero. Now, is that a capitalist country or it's the second highest share of GDP after North Korea in terms of government spending? Right. This is France for you. And then you have like Taiwan, which, like in the book, as I've cited, in Taiwan, government spending as a share of GDP is twenty percent, and it was lauded as being this great model in the pandemic of a very efficient tech sector and very efficient state, which handled the pandemic well. So I've cited Taiwan as an example that you don't have to throw money at the problem endlessly. With the help of technology and having an efficient state, you can get much better results. So one of the things I've spoken about in the fixes chapter of the book at the end is like the fact that we have to think about how do you design a state for the 21st century. I think in many ways, in places like America, the state is still designed for the 20th century, still going back to doing industrial policy and other things, rather than this whole tech savviness that modern states like Taiwan, Singapore tend to do. Is this ever going to get solved, or unless only if there's a crisis? Unfortunately, this is the message that a big course correction in any country happens only once you get a crisis. Once you get a crisis, that's when you begin to get change. You begin to get some, you know, meaningful reform which takes place. So I think that it's only when the government truly runs out of money that you begin to get change. But in the book, what I've tried to do, Nandan, is to show that this crisis is already happening in an insidious way. There's the apparent crisis, which is the government runs out of money. You get a fiscal crisis, you get a financial crisis, and then the government, you know, like stops these spendthrift ways. But the crisis we're seeing is that a question which I try to answer in the book is the productivity paradox. Why is it in the Western world today, including in America, is productivity growth falling or relatively low at a time when the midst of this incredible tech revolution? And as I argue that the only answer I can find to th that. Is that all these series of government interventions have undermined productivity growth, have destroyed the creative, destructive fiber of the economy, or at least undermined it? Now, it's not all. You know, as I said, these are shades of grey. There's a lot of strengths that America still has to offer because of its tech sector, because of still the fact that it's got a system which 
works. You know, there's a slogan that I cite in the book that for all people who criticize America, I remember seeing this placard somewhere in some country, I think it was Poland, where they were protesting about American occupation of the troops or something in Iraq. And they said, Yankees go home, but take me with you, right? So the fact is that all said and done, it's still a great place and system to go. But the fact is that if today, two thirds of Americans themselves are saying, they think their economies and their countries moving in the wrong direction, there needs to be a wake up call. You have been listening to BIC Talks by Bangalore International Center. If you like what you heard, do follow us on social media. Keep up with our programming by signing up for our mailer on the website or leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. The crew that makes these podcasts possible is Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta on sound supervision and production with support from S. Saruna Raj and Raghu Tenkaila. Artwork is designed by Chandni Venkataraman of Criss Cross Design Studio. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel on your favorite podcast platform. It can also be accessed on our website, bangaloreinternationalcenter.org. This is Lekha Naidu, signing off on behalf of everyone at BIC. Bye.